initial eyesight of the family eye. So first, just table of contents, I'll be talking about nanotechnology, what it is and why it's important. Then the mechanism of sight, so how do we see and what happens when there's malfunction in some of those key components in our eyes. Then there's two types of implants, epiretinal and subretinal, some challenges to eye nanotechnology, and then the future advancements. So, what is nanotech? It involves the manipulation and manufacturing of materials and devices on the scale of nanometers, and just for scale, one nanometer equals to a billionth of a meter, so it's for small stuff. And why is it important? Well, with nanotechnology, we can make materials a lot lighter, smaller, and even more durable. In fact, nanotechnology is actually all around us. So everyone here has their phones out, laptops, even this camera is made up of super small devices that help make it just easier to use, smaller, lighter, as I said on the previous slide. Um, I wear contacts, that's an example of nanotechnology, um, and even our very own clothes. So I did some research, and apparently there are um, small nanoparticles of zinc oxide in our clothing that um, make that protect our skin from UV rays. So that was really interesting. Now getting to sight. As my presentation is on eye nanotechnology, I thought it's important to just understand how the eye works, how we see, and like the important functions and structures of the eye. Starting with the retina, which is the innermost layer of this eye, um, it's really important because it contains photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are what convert the light and images that we see into electrical um, impulses that can be interpreted by our brain. Then there's ganglion cells. Those are present on the surface of our retina, and those just help uh, pass this electrical signal down the neural pathway. There's bipolar cells. Those are present in the middle layer of the retina, and those actually pass the electrical impulse from the photoreceptors to those ganglion cells. The optic nerve is that structure right over here. And that just sends all this visual information to our occipital lobe. And then the occipital lobe, or cortex, you can use interchangeably, is where um, all this visual information actually gets processed. So it's like how it gets interpreted and how we see. However, there are some times when things go wrong, specifically in our photoreceptors. I'll be talking about an eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. And this is caused by the breakdown of those photoreceptors in our retina and this can lead to the loss of peripheral vision, um, that's early symptoms, and then later on, the complete loss of vision. So this is like an animated big picture, but this is kind of how um, someone's eye looks like, who has RP, there's like, just a deterioration of those uh, photoreceptors. And the reason why I do mention RP is because um, the eye nanotechnology that I will be talking about aims to counteract this specific eye disease, so not all types of it's just this one. Um, and just for some numbers, there's over 2 million people who currently suffer with RP, so it's great that they, we have um, technology that aims to counteract it. Okay, well, let's get into the implants. So, okay, epiretinal implants. So these are placed on the surface of the retina, kind of tells you that in the prefix epi. Um, and these are adjacent to the ganglion cells. Okay, let's step over here. Um, this in red is the surface of our retina. This is the microchip, we'll get to that later. And then these kind of cell looking things in the yellow and red are the ganglion cells that are right beside it. An example of an uh, epiretinal prosthesis or implant is Argus II. This was approved in Europe in 2001 and then later the United States in 2013. It has external components such as a gla glasses with a camera mounted in the middle, a coil and a visual processing unit or a VPU. Then there are also internal components. There's a receiver, a microchip with 60 electrodes and a tack that attaches it to our retina. And I just have a picture of everything. So this is the camera, it's a little bulky, but it's functioning. The camera um, onto the glasses, that is the coil that connects to this visual processing unit. And then internally, this is the eye implant, what actually goes inside your eye. That's the microchip and that's the receiver. So how does it work? So the camera that's mounted onto the glasses captures live images from all around us. And that visual processing unit is what actually um, takes that photo and just kind of simplifies it down into a 60 pixelated image. The reason why um, the image is in 60 pixels only is because the microchip on the eye has 60 electrodes. So the amount of electrodes equals the amount of pixels your image can be simplified into. Um, and this pixelated image is what gets sent 
through the coil, the outer coil, um, to the receiver. The receiver sends that image to the microchip, and the microchip um, acts as a photoreceptor, and it converts that image, that information, to um, electricity or an electrical impulse that stimulates the ganglion cells, and then it's allowed to go through the neural pathway, ending up at the visual cortex where it's then processed. Um, and there's a little segment video down here. For time, I can't show it, but if you want to like, just let me know. And then this is kind of um, a visual summary of everything I just said. So let's say the person wearing the implant, they see a bike. This is how the bike looks to us, but the visual processing unit will simpli simplify into a black and white pixelated image. This is the image that is simplified and pixelated, 60 pixels only, and then um, that's what the person will see. So that's kind of the bike on the vision. And so results. So the results, um, these results that I'll talk, uh, I've been talking about are taken from 30 patients who underwent this implantation. Um, so in all participants, there was improved visual tasks, such as um, square localization. So there was a, like, a black monitor, like think of a computer, and a square was taken all across the computer and they were successfully, um, they could successfully track it, as well as tracking a white line similar to the, the square, there was a line that was just put all across the flip monitor and they could track it successfully. Um, direction of motion was improved, so all participants could walk along the sidewalk um, successfully. However, one downside would be conjunctible erosion. Um, and due to the implant, some of the patients, not all, it was the minority of them, had some scraping of the cornea, um, which can cause redness and some ocular pain. Next, we'll get into subretinal implants. So these implants are placed beneath the retina, and they are near to the bipolar cells. So this pink thing is the retina, and then underneath, that's the subretina, and that's where this implant is placed. An example of a subretinal uh, implant is Alpha AMS. This was approved in Europe in 2016, and it was manufactured by some people in Germany. It has external components such as an earpiece that goes like up and behind your ear, a power source that powers the entire operation, and a coil. It also has internal components such as a microchip with 16,000 electrodes. So now your pixel image can be 16,000, not 16,000, 1,600, sorry, that's a big difference. Um, and it also has an inner coil. This is a photo of just the entire thing. This is the earpiece that goes behind your ear. It connects the external parts to the internal parts, and then that's how the microchip will look like in your eye. It has 1,600 electrodes, not 16,000. Okay, so how does it work? It's actually pretty similar to Argus 2 in that this microchip is acting as a photoreceptor. It takes the light that you see and it converts it into an electrical impulse that can be sent to those bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells, down the neural pathway, ending up at the optic nerve, then to the visual cortex where it is then in the process. So results, similar again to Argus 2, is that there was um, adequate light perception um, in all participants. Um, even grading detection, grading is if you can differentiate between like black and white parallel lines, so like that detailed kind of vision was improved, as well as localization of high contrast objects, so there was a dark table and they could locate high contrast um, objects. Again, one downside as it always is, was damage to the implant. So these results were taken over the course of a couple years, and I think it was by around year three that there was some uh, erosion of the implant, which means they had to take it out. And I actually found this really cool video of like how it works. It's like 40 seconds, it's super short. I thought I would show it. It works. Yay. So that's the subretinal implant. And it's being embedded into the subretinal layer in your eye between those bipolar cells. And then light is gonna hit that microchip. And as you can see, it's converting it into an electrical impulse, kind of below it. And it keeps on just amplifying the signal. Eventually, it will make its way down the neural pathway. That's the optic nerve, and it's going to go straight to our occipital lobe where it's going to be processed. So that was a pretty good video. Is it okay if that is up there? I don't know how to get it back. Um, however, there are some challenges to this iNow technology that I'll be going through. Number one is the cost. So for both Argus 2 and Alpha AMS, the implant, just the implant, costs 
115000 to $150,000. And again, that's just the implant. If you add the cost of the actual surgery and the cost of the rehabilitation that they have to undergo af afterwards for the next couple of years, it actually amounts to $500,000, which I don't know if everyone has that amount of money on them. So um, that can be, make it pretty inaccessible as well as limited eligibility. So as I mentioned around the beginning of this presentation, this eye nanotech is only for those who have RP. And the reason behind that is um, those who have RP were not born blind. They had a gradual loss of sight. For people who can normally see, like all of us here, we have a functional visual cortex. That is what actually processes this visual information. So people who are born blind don't have an actual functioning visual cortex, which means they can't use eye nanotechnology. So, um, limited eligibility. Um, fourthly, thirdly, um, conjunctival erosion. We saw this with um, Argus 2 and that the microchip can cause um, scraping of the cornea, which can be really painful. I wear contacts and if I even put it in the wrong way or I get like a speck of dirt inside, like it feels like someone's stabbing my eye. So I can't imagine like having an implant like stuck in my eye, just creating that like pain over and over again. Um, and then lastly, implant degradation. So this is alpha EMS. So over a couple of years, because of the material of a microchip, it can actually erode, and that would make the entire op operation pretty much useless. However, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Due to future advancements in nanotechnology, Elon Musk's Neuralink. Um, thank you, Dr. Solis, for sending me that video. It's really interesting. Um, so Neuralink is Elon Musk's way of bionic vision and helping those who cannot see to see. Um, and it's actually a brain-computer in interface. So we came up with a chip called the N1 chip, and this is actually implanted in your brain. So it's a brain implant instead of an eye implant, which I think is pretty beneficial because you get to um, kind of stay, steer away from the conductible erosion. There's, now there's not gonna be any problems with scraping of eyes or anything like that. And so the mechanism is that there will be um, glasses. So you, ha you will have to wear glasses, not the bulky ones that we saw in Argus 2, just normal looking glasses, kind of like the ones you were wearing at Priscilla's. Um, there's going to be a tiny little camera implanted um, on the side of the glasses, and that will just capture the live images that we see all around us. And then what will convert this, if those images to an electrical signal is actually our smartphones. So your smartphone will convert um, the images into an electrical signal, and then wirelessly it will be sent to the N1 chip. This N1 chip will then send um, all these electrical signals to our brain through tiny electrical wires that's gonna be connected to. And then that's gonna create vision. Um, and again, a video, not a video, but a photo summary. The glasses will capture live what we see all around us. Um, it also will be black and white and pixelated, so just a little note there. Our phone will convert this into an electrical signal and then through the N1 chip and then the electron tiny wires stimulating our brain, we will be able to see this. So there are a lot of benefits to this Neuralink. Number one is that we get to replace those electron microchips with tiny flexible electron wires. Um, and the first reason why that's pretty beneficial is that um, as we saw beforehand in the eye implants, microchips easily degrade over time just because of the material that they're made out of. So we get to steer away from that. Um, and secondly, is that the microchips that we saw in Alpha AMS and even Argus 2 are limited by their size. I mentioned it briefly, but the amount of pixels your image can be in equals the amount of electrodes on your microchip. And um, the higher resolution, like more resolution in a photo, as we see in like TVs, like a 4K TV, for example, is like 8.3 million pixels. That's a lot of pixels. But to have that type of resolution, you would need millions of electrodes. But the more electrodes means the bigger the microchip and our eyes are only so big. So you're kind of limited by our eye size and you're limited by how big that microchip can be. But with the electrode wires um, it's act and the N1 chip, it's actually equivalent to 16,000 electrodes. And Elon Musk plans to have two N1 chips in our brains, one on the left and one on the right. Um, so that would equal to 32,000 electrodes, which is much higher resolution, improved vision for all those who use this implant. Um, secondly, is that it's all wireless. So in the previous implants I was talking about before, you had that visual processing unit that you have to carry around. You had the wires, the coils, and everything, which can get just a lot to carry around. Um, but now, all we will have is a camera that's implanted in glasses, just normal-looking glasses. 
Um, and then our phones is going to be what is doing this conversion. And everyone already has their phones on them, so it's not anything extra to carry. And then lastly is actually surgical robots. So as I mentioned before, this is a brain implant, so there's going to need to be certain neurosurgery that the patient undergoes. However, he's created a, a robot called the R1 robot to do the surgery. Um, and I think that's really cool because these electrical wires that will be put in our brains have to be in very, very specific locations so that they stimulate the correct places like, correctly. Um, and there's a lot of room for error with humans that did the operation. One little shaky hand or one millimeter micrometer off could um, result in the entire operation pretty, be, pretty much being useless. So because we have this, these robots, this AI that can now do the surgery, um, there's going to be improved surgery, improved results, improved vision for those who undergo this implant. And again, there's just the union of AI and nanotechnology. As we've been learning about in this class, about the technological singular, singularity and even like just the possibility of an entirely automated world, I think it's in the right direction. We're taking the, the step in the right direction with you and AI and nanotechnology together. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we're, we're probably not far from uh, devices like this that are actually better than regular sight, right? And, and uh, remember that Osmer um, Zayan talked about cameras that are much, much better than our sight and, and the idea of, you know, implanting eyes like that. And that will be true, presumably, for everything that, that the body does, you know? You have a normal arm, but if you get an artificial arm, you'll be able to do lots of things that the normal arm can't. So it, it, it'll be a new thing that sort of separates people by sort of uh, their politics, you know. Whether you think having all natural body parts is, you know, the best way to go, or, or, or if you want to actually enhance yourself so every part of you is better than than, than it would what 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 it would be, you know. So it's it's true that up until now we've been dealing with the other side, where where the implants give you sight that's not as good as regular sight. Mm -hmm. But I think we're close to the point where it's it be actually better. better. Than what we see. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? So any other questions? Mm -hmm. It was good. I really enjoyed that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's good. Great. Okay, so we'll now go on to the next speaker.